Hello there and welcome to the Evergreen Building at the College of Southern Idaho. Uh, we're here for another installment of our Rocks with Wilsey series. Today we're going to be looking at a group of metamorphic rocks. I believe we'll have one more video for sure. Uh, and then that should wrap up our, our series on rocks. I've got a couple other ideas of some other uh, topics in geology we might explore together in the classroom though. So. Uh, my name's Sean Wilsey, I'm geology professor here, and we're going to start by looking at uh, some of the, the metamorphic rocks, uh, especially today we're going to focus on the foliated metamorphic rocks. So as we often do, we're going to start here with uh, some notes. These are available under the, let me turn this around here, excuse me, um, under the video description you, you can uh, access these notes if you're interested in getting some of these on your own. So we're going to specifically look at four foliated metamorphic rocks, slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss. Um, so these rocks are foliated. And foliation, we've talked about this a bit before in our introduction to metamorphic rock series. Um, but foliated rocks are when we have minerals aligned along a uh, planar orientation. So all the minerals are lined up in a certain direction due to the unequal pressure that's been imparted on those rocks during the metamorphic process. Now, what I have here is bewaring of relict bedding. And what I mean by that is that, remember, bedding is a planar orientation that shows up in sedimentary rocks. It's the layering that we see in sedimentary rocks. And so you do have to be a little bit careful because just because you see some lines or layers in a metamorphic rock, don't jump to conclusions that that rock is necessarily foliated. What you want to do is convince yourself that the minerals are, are aligned or are following that layering or that fabric you see in those metamorphic rocks. So as an example, uh, what I have here is a piece of quartzite. And we'll talk more about quartzite next time when we look at non-foliated rocks. But as you look at this rock, and this is a nice river cobble that's been uh, broken open, but you might be able to pick out these faint lines running through this rock more or less left to right on, on the screen there. If we flip over the fresh surface, you can still pick out a very crude fabric running through the rocks this way. So initially you might be inclined to believe that this is a foliated metamorphic rock, but what you'd really want to do is look at this rock closely, maybe with some magnification, and see if the minerals themselves are aligned or are following that layering. And I think even with this magnification, you can see that that's not true, that the, the minerals in this rock tend to be somewhat randomly arranged, more or less helter-skelter, and they are definitely not aligned or following uh, that orientation or that fabric in there. So this, this is an example of relic bedding. When this rock was a sandstone, um, the bedding and the layering in that sandstone has been preserved even though the rock's been heated and squeezed a little bit to become a metamorphic rock, in this case, quartzite. So just be aware of that as you look at your um, metamorphic rocks. We talked last time about the variations between low grade to high grade, just to basically a temperature and pressure spectrum from the lowest temperatures and pressures up to the higher uh, temperatures and pressures. So we often talk about our metamorphics in terms of their grade being low to high grade. And we also use this diagram last time as well. This one's nice because it nicely shows the four rocks we're going to focus on today. So slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss. Notice that those all might develop from the same original parent rock. You might have originally a shale, a sedimentary rock that gets squeezed and um, heated a bit to become slate. If you increase the, increase the temperatures and pressures a little bit more, you'd get a phyllite. Increasing temperatures and pressures to get a schist. And finally, at the highest grade of metamorphic conditions, that same original rock might become what we call a gneiss. Um, so this shows the relationship with respect to a maybe a, a pluton or a magma body, an intrusion of magma. And that might be the main cause of the heating um, and the change in rock type. We also might see it, that gradational sort of spectrum, if you will, occurring at a, a plate boundary. And this is meant to show, let me zoom in just a little bit here, a convergent plate boundary. So notice we've got 
two plates colliding here. We've got the intervening mountains forming between the two plates that are colliding. And then what the diagram is showing you is, is as we increase the depth and location of these rocks, we have higher temperatures and pressures. So at low temperatures and pressures near the surface, we might see a slate, a little bit further down a phyllite, then a schist and then a gneiss. So the whole point is that the, this is a spectrum. This is a, a continuum from one rock type to the next, depending on the specific um, temperatures and pressures involved. So let's focus on these individually and then I'll show you a couple samples that I've prepared to help you uh, kind of identify these a little bit. So let's start with slate. You might be familiar with slate. It's used as a building stone. Um, there's places uh, in the world where it's used as a tile on roofs. Like when I've been to Wales uh, in the United Kingdom, they use a lot of slate for a lot of their buildings there. It's a very dense uh, rock. It's typically kind of dull colored earth tones. It's very fine grained. It's incredibly fine grained material. And as a foliated rock, it spits, splits easily along that foliation plane. So it easily breaks along that surface. It looks a lot like shale. Um, and until you really kind of pick it up and maybe bang it around or test it a little bit, it would be easily confused with shale. But it's actually a little bit more hard and dense than shale. It's more or less the metamorphic equivalent of shale. Outside, these two are easy to tell apart because you can use the regional context. So for example, you have a dark colored fine grained rocks that splits into layers. Well, it could be a shell or it could be a slate. So I would look at the surrounding rocks. If the surrounding rocks tend to be sedimentary, maybe there's some sandstone, some conglomerate, some limestone, then you undoubtedly would have a shale as the rock of interest there. But if the rocks that neighbor or are uh, near the slate above it and below it are metamorphic, maybe some marble, some quartzite, um, something like that, then you would have a slate. So a lot of times it's easier to tell outdoors where we have that context, uh, the difference between these two. When people bring me uh, rocks just in their hand, it's sometimes a little bit trickier. Um, if we have fossils in it, it would definitely be a shale. Although slates, you might still get some fossils preserved, but sometimes they end up getting a little bit deformed or distorted during the metamorphic process. So remember slate is the lowest grade form our lowest grade metamorphic conditions, so low temperatures and pressures, and the parent rock or the original rock tends to be uh, shale or mudstone. So I've got a couple, couple examples here. Um, let me zoom out a little bit. So you can see this more or less dull colored, very fine grained um, slate here. We can actually see the foliation, the actual alignment of the minerals. The rock itself is gonna tend to present itself as, as a thin, slab or a tabular piece. So that's always a hint that you might be looking at a foliated rock. They tend to weather and break, at least many of them, in, in sheets like this. Um, slate, of course, is used for pool tables. So it's, it, it's quarried and used for all sorts of things, um, but it's a very durable type of material. So we've got one here. Here's another, again, very kind of thin, uniform. But notice the grain size, which is probably a little hard to tell here, is very, very small. The, the particles that make up the slate are incredibly fine grained. But typical colors, it could be red, it could be black, gray, um, kind of greenish. Um, those are some of the more drab colors that you typically see with slate. If we increase the metamorphic conditions a little bit more though, we end up with a rock called phyllite or phyllite. I've always called it phyllite. Um, it might be one of those tomato, tomato type of things, but I've always gone with uh, phyllite. If you call it phyllite, then that's okay too. Um, these will also be fairly fine grained, but a little bit more coarse than slate. And the main way to tell slate apart from phyllite is by the time you've increased the metamorphic conditions uh, to create a phyllite, you're gonna see a little bit of a sheen. You're gonna get a little bit of a reflection of the light from the rock because the micas, the mica minerals like muscovite and biotite are large enough that they're actually reflecting the light to some degree. Sometimes the foliation in a phyllite might be a little bit wrinkled or wavy, kind of what we call crenulated. It kind of goes up and down. Um, it's still considered low grade metamorphism and the parent rock will be pretty much the same as a, a shale. This should say mudstone. That's a little bit of a typo there, I apologize. Uh, or a slate itself, right? So this is just increasing the conditions for a slate to create a phyllite. So notice that as I rotate this 
rock here, you're catching flashes of light off the surface. And yet when we try to look closely for the individual mica crystals, we just don't quite see them. We can see there's an overall sheen or a luster to the rock, but not to the point where we can see the individual mica crystals. Again, it's breaking into sheets. It's breaking into these sort of tabular uh, 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 orientations here. You can also see some of the, the foliation showing up on the edge right there. Um, I've got one more right here, like another pretty good phyllite. This one again shows that kind of nice sheen or luster on the edge here. We can see some of the foliation. So we can see that the minerals are lined up in this planar arrangement and that's affecting the overall shape of the rock. So we have micas in the rock, but they're just not quite big enough to see them individually. So if we bump up the temperatures and pressures a little bit more, now we've got a rock called a schist. Now be careful how you say and spell this so that you keep everything nice and uh, family friendly. But uh, there's definitely a C in this word and then a second S. Make sure you keep those in there. So a schist is where we're going to get temperatures and pressures a little bit higher such that the mica crystals grow larger. So these are going to be incredibly shiny rocks very obvious and visible mica crystals. This rock is associated with higher temperatures and pressures, so what we call medium grade metamorphism. Occasionally in schists, we get large crystals of a uh, variety of minerals forming. We call those large crystals porphyroblasts, so that can be your fun word for the day. Remember, we, kind of, we, we recognize part of this word uh, because we talked about igneous rocks and we talked about porphyritic rocks, and porphyritic rocks were rocks that had uh, exceptionally large crystals embedded in a fine grain matrix. This is a very similar phenomenon, but instead of being in an igneous rock, it's in a metamorphic rock, so porphyroblasts. Uh, and then sometimes we use those big special minerals that are very obvious in, oh, I just dropped the camera there, sorry. Uh, those big distinctive minerals can be used as an adjective for the overall rock type. And so you might refer to a rock as a kyanite schist, or if there's two distinctive minerals, it might be called a muscovite garnet schist or a garnet muscovite schist. So you sometimes see those qualifiers or adjectives ahead of the word or term schist. Parent rock, uh, again, shale, uh, could be mudstone. I don't know why this is sandstone. That, um, I think the, although I think sandstone's also, so I'd say shale, mudstone, and sandstone are possible parent rocks. Uh, even basalt, depending on the composition of the basalt, which can vary somewhat, can metamorphose into schist. There's other rocks that are, met, are the metamorphic equivalent of basalt as well. Uh, and then tuff, and then we've talked about phyllite before. So let me show you a couple schists. We'll start with maybe the most dazzling one here. Uh, maybe I'll put that down and zoom in. There we go. Uh, so you can see the overall size of the mica crystals is quite large. You can see the individual mica crystals in the schist. If we turn it on its side, we can see the layering. We can see that the minerals are following the foliation plane, the overall fabric or layering in the rock. So when we look at the foliation plane um, from the top view, we can see all the shiny crystals, but because all those crystals are laying on that plane, when you rotate it to the side view, it's, it's much less reflective because of that. So just a beautiful, um, I guess a muscovite or mica schist right here. Zoom out so you can see how big that one is. A um, couple more that I have. Here's one with a little bit different color to it, more of a, a silvery color. Uh, again, if I zoom in nicely here and rotate it in the light, you really get a sense for how big these individual mica crystals are. So this is the sweet spot. This is the ideal temperatures and pressures that these mica crystals can grow quite large in a metamorphic rock. Again, on the end here, we can see some of the layering uh, of the rock. We can see the overall orientation of the foliation forming these more or less flat surfaces within the rock itself. But it's only on the foliation plane, the surface, where you're gonna see the most dazzling, uh, shiniest reflectivity from those mica crystals. Um, Another one, this one's a little bit um, less well foliated in terms of planar. It still shows the layering, but notice it's a little bumpy. It's a little irregular. Still has that great uh, schist quality of these large mica crystals, quite visible, quite shiny, uh, kind of eye-catching. And again, we can see some of the foliation there. Uh, and this one has one of those large porphyroblasts in it. So this 
particular schist. Let's start with the schist first. You can see some of the microcrystals in there reflecting in the light. And here we have a large garnet crystal. And this looks like, um, I'm no mineralogist, but this might be a twin. See how we actually sort of had two garnet crystals nucleating together um, and sort of sharing space. So this deep red here, this is a characteristic color of these garnets. And garnets are indicative of moderate to, to high temperatures and pressures. So we, we've nucleated the right chemical stew uh, for these garnet crystals to form and form quite large within, within this lovely schist here. So, um, okay, our last rock type. Let's get the paper tuned out there. We got a bunch of mica on it. Uh, so our last rock type, uh, and schist is a German word, and the next one is also a German term. And it's called nice. So even though the spelling looks a little odd, it's actually pronounced nice, just like have a nice day. And in a nice, what we're going to see is we've reached such high temperatures and pressures that the micas aren't stable at those temperatures and pressures. And what we get instead is uh, more or less a segregation or um, breakdown of the light and dark colored minerals. And so it's going to look like a banded rock. It's going to look like zebra stripes, alternating light and dark. Those felsic and mafic minerals are going to separate into bands of light and dark colored minerals. Generally, it's a pretty coarse grained rock. So I think we've seen that as you increase the metamorphic grade, the size of the crystals gets larger, more or less. Uh, nices are indicative of high grade metamorphism. So the very highest temperatures and pressures that we can induce on the rocks and still be within the realm of metamorphism. Uh, I'll show you a special one called an Augen Nice, which is kind of a fun, uh, fun rock where the, some of the feldspar or other crystals have been deformed uh, into these eye shapes. And this is the German name for eye. And then you can see the list of parent rocks there. So it could be a schist itself, could be some of these other rocks that have been metamorphosed into a gneiss. And sometimes these are used as modifiers as well. If we're uh, certain that the rock originally was a granite, sometimes you hear something like a granite gneiss or a granitic gneiss. So I'm gonna move the camera for this one because these rocks are a little bit bigger, at least some of them. Um, maybe we'll start with the small one here and then we'll move to some of the larger ones. Um, but this is a little stream cobble and you can see the alternating light and dark layers in this. Lots of quartz, feldspar, and then some of the dark minerals like maybe uh, amphibole, maybe pyroxene. Sometimes it might be a little bit of biotite in there as well. But you can see that there's a banded appearance to these as these uh, minerals have been broken down and separated to some degree. Uh, really big rock here, um, but same sort of thing. Uh, lovely, nice here with the banding alternating light and dark layers running through the rock. Um, this one here is pretty interesting because it also shows uh, some signs of, of more uh, shearing and, and deformation. It's a little more banded, um, less granular, I suppose. And you can actually see some of the, the deformation, ductal deformation around some of these crystals here. And um, again, I'm not a metamorphic petrologist, but these are things of interest because sometimes you can tell a lot about how the rock's been deformed uh, by studying the, the shape of these as well. But here's a nice uh, banded quartzite. From, I believe that one's from Arizona. Um, this one's from northern Utah in the Wasatch Range. These are some of the 1.8 billion year old uh, Proterozoic basement rocks in that area. Uh, this one I believe was originally a granite and so it shouldn't be too much of a stretch to think about the black and white salt and pepper look of a granite and if you just imagine squeezing that in this direction you would get those minerals as they're kind of warm and pliable they would rotate and align themselves perpendicular to that pressure uh, to form the foliation here with the alternating light and dark bound bands here's the algin nice hopefully this one shows up pretty well i had a student give this to me so and i can't remember off the top of my head where he located it but you can see some of these large pinkish uh, feldspar crystals and they have taken on kind of a lens shape, sort of an eyeball shape. They're not perfectly eyeball shaped, but you can see there's an overall um, arrangement or stretching as they've been squeezed and attenuated to some degree. You can see that the shape of these large crystals in the, in the gneiss. And so this is what we call an Augen gneiss, um, German for eyeball. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this one is if you look at the top of it, 
if we kind of zoom in a little bit, you'll see some flashes of light in here. Um, so if I rotate that, you might see some little reflections in the rock. So this rock does contain some mica. And this is where you can kind of have fun with some of the names is this rock fundamentally is a nice, but because it still has the micas that we would associate with a schist, you could call this a nice schist or a schistos nice, probably schistos nice or um, something like that would be more appropriate, but you can kind of have fun with these kind of questionably questionable names and kind of go a little bit crazy there. But keep it family friendly. Don't offend anyone, um, but have fun with those two names there. So, um, so that's, uh, I think, the end of our survey of the foliated rocks. We've looked at uh, the slate. We looked at phyllite. We looked at uh, schist, which is now over there. And we've looked at some various types of of nice here. So I hope that was helpful for you. Um, appreciate you joining me today. We'll do at least one more rock series. We've got some non-foliated metamorphic rocks that we're going to look at uh, next. So look for that soon. Uh, appreciate you joining me. Please like, share, subscribe. Uh, keep promoting this geology education to those who are interested. And I appreciate all the donations from those who have provided them. Uh, there's a thanks button below the video on the right if you want to make a donation. There's a donate button on the banner. And then under the video description, there's some information there for ways that you might be able to donate. So hope you enjoyed me with another uh, exciting overview of rocks, metamorphic rocks with Sean Wilsey.